Hi, welcome to Infinite Leaders Live. My name is Lewis Keynes and our why as ever is simple, to be better educators and to be better humans. We want everybody, regardless of role, rank or responsibility, to feel supported and encouraged to be willing to listen and to learn. As ever, I'm joined by my pal, Alan. How are you, Alan? Yeah, good. Thank you, Lewis. And we'll continue to focus on the things you don't get taught at university or on any courses, real life lessons from real life people with real life experience. And if you've listened to us before, you know there'll be a few mistakes along the way. We're learning and this is a journey for us and we're really enjoying that journey. If you have any feedback, please do let us know at theinfinitelearners.com, on Instagram, YouTube, and you can also find us on Twitter. Um, let's crack on, Alan. Listen, learn and share. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Get your pens and papers ready, guys. There's going to be some absolute gems of leadership wisdom coming out of the show today. Uh, Richard Stubbs is a senior public and private sector CEO and non-executive director with current leadership roles in health, innovation, regional economic development, international partnerships and education. Richard is a leader with strong communication, relationship building and political skills, who has a track record of delivering both the public and the private sector. His current interests include the spread and adoption of innovation across the NHS, defining a more productive relationship between the NHS and healthcare industry, cross-boundary leadership in the public sector, and exploring commercial and philanthropic opportunities for UK PLCs in international healthcare markets. So Richard, great to have you on the show. Tell us a, a little bit about the start of your life journey from, from that South Yorkshire mining village of Malpe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Lewis. It's, it's great to be here. Um, Yes, Maltby. Um, So, you know, for people around your global audience who may not know, you know, Maltby is a small pit village in, in, in the middle of South Yorkshire, which is pretty much in the middle of England. And yeah, I mean, I had a pretty, well, you know, I suppose everyone considers themselves have a pretty normal upbringing, don't they? Because it's their, all they know. But for me, life in a, in a fairly working class pit village is, is what I, what I know. And I actually left Maltby um, to then go to university. I went to university at York. So I stayed in God's own county of Yorkshire um, to do politics, philosophy and economics. And, and that led me um, via a very protracted path towards the BBC. Actually, I, went to, I was one of those people who went to university you know, having not a clue, not a clue what I wanted to do in life. And actually the degree I chose, politics, philosophy and economics, PPE, was largely because it felt like the kind of thing that didn't, close any doors off at that time. It, it, it left everything open. Um, you know, you could work it out later almost. And what I discovered at university was I really fell in love with uh, the media, particularly radio, actually. I ended up spending three years, um, my entire three years at York, running um, the, the local student radio station, University Radio York, and doing a show there as well and various other types of productions. And really loving, fell in love with both media as a medium, um, you know, radio in particular, but also actually um, the joy of being a leader, the joy of being a station manager, you, you know, albeit on a really small scale, there were some really interesting leadership challenges during my time at York. And that was something that I really grew to, to love. But I left university really wanting to do television or radio. Um, and I did, I'd done enough work experience during my time to know that although it probably wasn't going to be my long-term career, I didn't want to leave that arena just yet and spent a year year and a half working out how somebody from a pit village in Maltby goes about getting into the BBC and you know <laughs> starting off on absolutely the wrong foot which was to naively think that all these job adverts that were published every Monday morning in the media guardian were real and were aimed at people like me and of course they weren't but I spent you know six to nine months of that year just waiting for every Monday and pretty much sending a CV and a covering letter off to every single advert that was listed in the Guardian. And then you start to realize that actually it's not about that at all. It's about who you know. And when you're a kid from a pit village mob, the answer to that question is zero, you know nobody. So then it was a case of six degrees of separation. You know, who do I know or who, do, more importantly, who does, who does my mum know who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who might know somebody who's worked at the BBC once. And, it was literally a chain that looked like that. I and mean, that led me to um, be given a chance to have four weeks work experience at the BBC, which I grabbed and clung on with my fingernails 
um, for a, a, a wild ride in, in television um, for, for four, four or so years. And that was fantastic. Um, loved it. And in many ways, although again, unexpected, the BBC was almost a finishing school for me. I, I, you know, I came out of university with a lot of um, uh, actual knowledge, I guess, around my degree and, and some level of understanding about how the media works. But the politics of large bureaucracies, the how you actually uh, thrive in a in a fairly dynamic cutthroat industry such as television. That four years was absolutely um, integral to my understanding, often, you know, learning the hard way, in fact, nearly always learning the hard way, to be honest, but it was like a finishing school of that kind of small p politics about big corporate bureaucracies. And um, I really, really loved my time there. I've got a, n a number of friends who are still there. But actually, the next thing after four years, I started to think, well, this is great. And you work incredibly hard. But actually, if I'm honest, I didn't really have much love for the output. So the kind of programs that I was lucky enough to work on weren't the kind of programs that I'd sit down on an evening and watch. I wouldn't even recommend other people to watch them. I was doing a lot of daytime shows, a lot of big Saturday night entertainment shows. It's amazing fun to work on, but actually, you know, I barely watched anything that we ever produced. So I started to think, well, if it's, you know, you think about the longer term, big grown up job, that's probably the next thing I've got to go to. I was about 25 by this point. What is it that I could do that actually is going to give me a, energy you know to get out of bed in the morning gonna think gonna be really um proud of the outputs that i'm creating or the impact that i'm having and even though my mom's an executive director of nursing in the nhs or was at that time i'd never considered health actually i stumbled across the graduate management scheme for the nhs which is a fast-tracked entry route for graduates or recent graduates and people from the service as well and that's incredibly competitive probably the single biggest life-changing uh, announcement of my life was the day I realized I'd got onto the graduate management scheme. I knew then it was a really, really important turning point for me. Um, thousands upon thousands of people apply for these things every year. At the time, there was about 50 or 60 places nationally available. Um, and that's what led me to the NHS. So that was now, sad to say, about 18 years ago. But I went into the NHS as a graduate trainee, which is a wonderful opportunity in terms of the passport that you're given to explore all sorts of aspects of the service, really get to know it and get to know its values. And after a fairly normal kind of postgraduate scheme career, for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've been lucky enough to fall into more national roles. I found a real passion around innovation, um, innovation in health, isn't so much about invention. We're great at inventing. We, we invent 600 times every week across the health service, new fantastic ways of doing things. Our problem when it comes to innovation is spread. And that's a challenge that I've been trying to crack for 10 years. How do you actually spread the good practice that happens in every single corner of the health service and ensure that all our population, all our patients get to experience it? And the more I work on that, challenge the more you find that that challenge actually is a cultural challenge it's nothing to do with technology it's nothing to do with the innovation itself it's to do with ending the culture of not invented here you know we can't possibly accept this import of a of a solution from somewhere else because it's, it's different here because or the perverse financial incentives that mean that people make the wrong decision albeit for what seems to them like right reason so there's huge cultural challenges in the NHS about how we get this right so that's the kind of thing that I'm really passionate about tackling and that's that's what I've been doing in various different jobs various different national jobs for the last 10 years but right now as we speak I'm in the best job I've ever done um, which is chief executive of something called an academic health science network um, which is a bit of a mouthful and we normally call it an AHSN but the AHSN is here to get in that triangle between the health service, the academics side, particularly on research and industry, who are really important partners to the NHS, and to help to think about how we accelerate that spread and adoption of innovation. How do we, how do we get the health service to be a place where it's not just right for now, it's right for the next five, 10, 20, 30 years? How do you look at some really disruptive transformation, AI, machine learning, um, empowering people through wearables and other things like that. 
so a lot of, a lot of this is cutting edge a lot of this i i'm very fond of saying i get to live in the future now i get to to, to work with fantastic clinicians and academics and researchers um, uh, and, and industry figures all of whom have amazingly um uh unbelievable uh, thought processes about how health and healthcare delivery could look in 10 years. And I kind of grab onto their coattails and try and keep up with their thinking and then turn to the system and think, well, how can we get it done? How can we get this done now? So that's a job I'm absolutely loving. It's kind of almost a culmination of where I've come from. Um, it's got a bit of politics in it. It's got a lot of, a lot of culture in it. It's got a lot of, um, leading staff, which is a new thing for me, being a first time chief executive. Um, so it all feels like a great big melting pot. And, you know, dare I say it, it's my perfect job. So that's how I've got here, Alan. Wow, what a journey, what a journey. And I'd just like to go back to that, that pit village in Maltby that me and Lewis are very familiar with. We, we've took teams there, we've played football there, we've got friends from there. Tell us about how that upbringing there, well, how did that really shape your core values? I think it's, it's only in hindsight that you kind of understand how your upbringing has shaped you. Um, I think, I mean, so many different ways, both positive and negative. I mean, obviously, it goes without saying that, um, you know, as a, as a person of colour, who lived in a white working class pit village in South Yorkshire, race played a huge factor here. Um, I often think about whether you'd want to change, as a person, as an individual, would I want to change my history? Would I want to change my journey? Actually, I think that's shaped me as much as anything else. I'm a very resilient person. I think when, you've, when you're in a fairly tough, comprehensive school of about you know, 1,400, 1,500 kids and you're pretty much the only black person there, including the teaching staff, then that's an upbringing that is, although it absolutely, I mean, bizarrely seemed completely and utterly normal to me at the time. When you look back and you look back at the, the daily micro um, aggressions, you look back at how you learned to pro project an outward facing confidence, despite what may be happening internally, because that was your defensive mechanism um, but equally how you learned to I think have a very or how I learned to have a very internalized sense of of um, of success you know I, I, I don't let anybody else define what success looks like to me I, I'm not I don't allow my own personal um, feelings or um, emotions I suppose to be kidnapped by what others try and project onto it um, so that sense of resilience I think is something that very much was um, was born for me um, coming up um, from Motby. But equally, and this is really interesting, I think in, the, in some of the worlds that I live in now, that kind of, you know, that heady mix of Whitehall and Westminster and, and even just London and the Southeast, I think having an innate understanding of what it feels like to grow up in a, in a mining village um, town, you know, a small town to have, I mean, I'm, I come from four generations under, you know, of miners um, I'm the first one of our, you know, of not to be, um, you know, down the pit. Um, you understand, I think, more about uh, life. You understand about how how normal people go about normal days outside of politics, and how actually, despite the Westminster bubbles um, understanding of this, most people, the majority of people, spend zero hours a day thinking about politics and how politics affects their life and when it comes therefore to things like how a large bureaucracy like the nhs start to interact with its public you really understand i think a little bit more that this isn't a logical um driver diagram that you can look at from the center of the nhs and and predict people's um you know how you can shift people's behaviors but this is all hearts and minds this is about appealing to people in ways that they you know that they want to see even when I was at the BBC, that was that was interesting. I mean, you know, if, if there was a breast cancer storyline on EastEnders, then the screening um, demand, the demand for screening for breast cancer across the country would would jump up, because actually putting something on EastEnders is a way of me, of reaching more people, particularly in hearts and minds, than any kind of you know policy op-ed piece put in place in the Daily Telegraph or, or the Guardian. So, 
there's that reality of the thing uh, of life, I think, Alan. But the, the final thing I say about growing up and how it's influenced me is um, I started to get really genuinely quite angry about the lack of opportunities that existed um, for me growing up in a place like Maltby. Again, it's not something that I even understood um, at the time. And even, you know, many years after that, it was only really now, you know, the last 10, 15 years or so when I've had the kind of job that's made me look at industry more, made me look at economic growth and the role economic growth plays. But looking at where, you know, particularly from a life sciences point of view, which is, you know, part of my world with health innovation, you look at London and the Southeast and you look at the jobs. And you look at all the jobs that I'm offered, you know, through LinkedIn or, or from recruitment consultants, and it's always, would you come down to London to do? Would you come down to the home counties to do? And it really, really started to get me quite angry that two things, growing up in a comprehensive school where the vast majority of kids and their parents had little to no ambition about what a career looks like. I was kept in the dark about all sorts of different career paths, which I think had I known at the time, you know, 14 year old me would have been really keen to know about the fact that there's, there's a thing called the city in London <laughs> and there are finance houses and banks and international investment banks. And these are the kind of jobs that they do. And lo and behold, I'm pretty good at maths and I'm really good at economics. And, you know, I think I could have landed there as a 21 year old and done quite well. Thank you very much. I didn't know about the city as a concept until I was way into my you know, mid twenties. Um, certainly not something I ever got from school. And that's just one example of what we weren't shown, the life that we weren't shown because the vast majority of our pupils um, didn't comprehend that level of ambition. And that's what's led me to join um, a board called the Local Enterprise Partnership, which is the economic growth board for the region. So it's completely separate to my normal job, but it, there's, there's lots of, um, um, interaction um, just because of the work that I do in my HSN role. But basically the, the, the Local Enterprise Partnership or the LEP is responsible for trying to drive economic growth and high value jobs into our region. So already now kids in Motby who, you know, like me, um, you know, when I, you know, my, the, the now 14 year olds can look down the road and they can see Rolls-Royce, they can see McLaren, they can see Siemens. There are more to come. Um, you know, they can see royal visits from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge coming to the McLaren factory to learn about the latest advanced manufacturing and material science that's going on in there. And they can start to see real high value jobs, literally a bike ride away from where they're growing up. Now, it wasn't like that for me. But the trick for me on that one is we can't stop there. We can't say, well, that's nice. We've got three interesting brands and that's that's good enough. Good enough for Rotherham, good enough for South Yorkshire. I think for me, my, my passion on that front is how do I actually make it so that it starts to look more like London and the South East and the kids in Mobby, you know, the next generation of kids in Mobby have an absolute menu of choices about what they can go and do. I've just a uh, lot to digest there, Richard. And, and I, I feel exact parallels with you growing up in in a tough area of Sheffield and yeah I got none of those opportunities that you talk about there in my comprehensive school and it's only since I moved probably internationally that I've opened my eyes and my kids eyes to the opportunities that are out there I, I feel even as a teacher in South Yorkshire I weren't I, I didn't have that knowledge to give and I certainly didn't see that being imparted on our kids in school. So I know you're part of the, the, the board in Maltby. How are you then trying to work with, with that school to, to give the opportunities that, that we didn't have? Yeah, so yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a trustee of the board for what's now called Maltby Learning Trust, which is my, my old junior school, my own my old comprehensive school, plus other junior schools and secondary schools in the region. And that's been, that's a fantastic experience, actually. I mean, just... Just as, as an aside, I mean, I was, I was always lamenting the fact that schools like mine didn't use their alumni. You know, I'd, I'd never been asked to go back and do anything. And I'm pretty sure that people didn't even know who I was or what I was doing now. And, and there, you know, there are people like me who have, who have got some careers that probably are worth something of value back to the school. 
Um, and then, of course, you're asked. So it's a bit of, you know, be careful what you wish for, because now all of a sudden you're asked to do something. So I couldn't really say, say no. Um, but um, what's fascinating to me is that when I was asked, I was thinking, well, what do I know about this? And actually, from a leadership perspective, um, I really quickly, I think, worked out that actually, despite the fact that education obviously is a very different sector with very different acronyms and a very different language, you know, not, not all of which I'm up to date with yet. But when you look at the challenges, it's workforce, it's finance, it's regulation. And actually, I understood those concepts from a health perspective. And even though the targets are different and the ambition is different and the work is different, actually, from a leadership level, those are the, those are the things that challenge us around the board table every single time. And I could use some of my transferable skills in, in those conversations. So I'm not quite, you know, an educationalist yet, but I certainly can, I think I can add some value around the board table. But yeah, I think, you know, the reason I went back to Maltby wasn't to help them to balance their budgets and it wasn't to help them to, um, with their regulators, although that's, you know, the job I'm doing. It was to be, or to offer myself as a role model and to start having conversations. And funny enough, Alan, like you say, with the teachers as much as with the pupils about what's possible. And I just, just got back in time for the last remaining teacher who was there when I was a pupil there to still be employed. He left about, um, this is not, <laughs> this is not because of me, but he, he was due to retire about three months after I joined the board. So we were just, just able to meet and reconnect. So it felt like a little bit of a history handover, which was fantastic. But it was to speak to people like him and his, and his successors to say, I am a product of a comprehensive school in the north of England. I didn't have additional tuition. I didn't have parents who were sharp elbowed and understood things like the university system. And I managed to go off and do X, Y, Z. I was definitely considered to be a, a good pupil, a strong pupil when I was there, you know, no doubt about it. It's not to say that school didn't know who I was. I was very much a, um, a strong learner, but I was still not given any kind of um, leg up or, or even suggested that I could go and achieve great things. And, and yet I have done what I've done, which I'm very proud of. And that's really what the message I'm trying to get through. So, I, so I've spent you know, most of my time volunteering to go back, talking to staff more than to pupils, because I think the, the, the sustainability of some of this that I can hopefully leave behind will be about the staff knowing in themselves that this is possible and starting to look at today's generation who might look like me and think, well, how can we do this better? Uh, because I still sense, um, not so much from the school, because I think the school is incredibly well led, but from the community, that that lack of ambition that I certainly understood is absolutely still there. In fact, you might argue it's increased. There is no longer even a pit for people to go and work there. So the options for them are probably, if they don't understand the McLarens and the Rolls Royces and how, it, how those jobs are there for them, not for other people, then they might think their options are limited. I wanted to touch on that, Richard, if you don't mind. There were, there were two concepts that you talked about earlier. You talked uh, really eloquently around ambition and about how difficult it was as a child to, to find something that really gave you a little bit of a spark. And you also touched upon race and, and, and that being a real barrier as well. What, what kind of changes going back into that education setting have you seen or are you hopeful of, of seeing in the near future? I mean, I've been um, <laughs> blown away, to be honest, by, by, by what I've seen and, and, and the, dif the differences and where the emphasis is now placed on, 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 on pupil progression, I guess. So it seems to me, and, and it's, it's difficult in a way, because obviously my first experience of this was as a pupil, a pupil who, you know, by and large, didn't take much notice of what's happening above the classroom that I happen to be in. And now, of course, I'm getting the insider track on, on, I suppose, the big strategy of what a school is trying to achieve. But there just seems to be um, so much more nuance and um, um, granularity about results, 
and about making sure that every child achieves the results that they are possible that it's possible for them to achieve so i think that's for me is, is the biggest thing i've noticed um what's also quite interesting i think has been the um the ability of a multi-academy trust as such as multi learning trust to be able to have a, a much bigger degree of flexibility in how it moves its staff around and to do so with a level of dynamism that certainly you know with the kind of the um uh, as well, you know the, the the ever presence of teaching who I understood in my in my time there, you know, people were there for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, even though they're perhaps not in the right place at the right time. Um, Maltby certainly now is a place that absolutely wants to make sure that the right teaching staff is in front of the right pupils on the right day. And if that's not working, we're going to shift it very quickly. So that's that's been a really and that's actually something that I think the NHS hasn't done yet. You know, we are very sluggish when it comes to knowing that people can achieve more by being in a different environment, but still not having either the mechanisms or the, the, um, the will, the leadership will to make it happen. So that, that for me has been incredibly impressive. And, and that's showing a little bit of, of innovation, am I right, in terms of how Maltby are, are, are moving around those staff. Can, can I go back to revisit that conversation that you started earlier around innovation and invention? What, what's the difference between innovation and invention and what are you seeing at Maltby at the moment? So innovation is the whole um, gamut of invention plus adoption. So invention is you and I finding a whizzy way of, you know, doing something fantastic on an app, but telling no one about it. But innovation is doing that and then having a you know a huge take up across the world of people using this and embedding it into parts of their everyday life and so innovation is really about the sustainable in, um, implementation of an of an innovation of an invention um i think i mean it's what i've seen at Mobby um is is limited in, not because they're not innovators but because of what i've had the ability to see or not but i think for me the biggest change has been obviously the 2020 shift in remote delivery of of um, of education, and how that has um, absolutely, I think, raised certain questions about the right models, and you know, not thinking about a one size fits all model of of delivery of of education programs. That for me is, is been very interesting. The other thing, though, that I've been really impressed with during my time on the board of Mobby is their communication skills. So the um, the material, the content that's aimed both at pupils but at parents as well has been phenomenal, actually. Very personally written, incredibly insightful um, and inspirational, actually. It goes without saying this is this is a long way away from being the letter home that you know I, I knew about. And even the, the things that I now get for my own kids' schools, they're not they're not in Motby, they're they're here in Sheffield. So that level of engagement and bringing people, you know, clearly trying to bring families together to join us on this mission is something that I think is quite innovative as well. Yeah, it, I think when we come in and talking about partnerships, that's really, really important. And, and you touched upon it with the NHS as well. And from what I'm hearing here, I think the NHS and the, and the education system in the UK, they're two great pillars moving forward politically. And how... How do you see the impact of, of the, the current coronavirus on, on both? And how are we going to move forward? It's it's incredibly worrying. And I think I'm I'm not sure if lucky is the right word, Alan, but certainly I'm in the right rooms to be hearing exactly what's happening, both from a health perspective, well, not just both, from a health perspective, from an economic growth perspective, and from an education perspective. So I have my briefings from um, people who know what they're talking about, you know, which isn't me, in my LEP role um, on economic growth, in my health role as a chief executive around South Yorkshire, and also educationally in terms of what's happening with our children. All those three things are really worrying. We are obviously and rightly focused right now on health. Um, you know, this is a, a here and now problem. And, you know, I don't have to tell you guys the... Um, the absolute critical needs to protect the NHS, protect any global health care system, um, and that we have a, an immediate challenge to retain the capacity in our hospitals and other 
health settings to ensure that we aren't overwhelmed by the now problem. But any of us who are thinking, you know, as this vaccine and the subsequent other vaccines start to get rolled out in 2021, then the problem is over. You know, I think probably we know that's not the case. I think we now start to, you know, by 2021, we'll start to pick up the pieces. What's happened here? Um, what are the longer term impacts of this unbelievable year? Education and growth are going to be huge losers in all this. And I think the left behind fear around education is the one that I most worry about. So we know that there is, uh, you know, in all walks of our life, coronavirus has laid bare the stark inequalities that have always existed in our society. And it's almost like, you know, the blanket has been pulled back and we've been allowed to see what many of us probably knew already in our various um, personal experiences, but to see the totality of the inequalities that exist in our system. And that's true even of the level of educational support that we know our children have had and how that varies from school to school and how having IT equipment in our house or not having IT equipment in our house has been a, a massive differential in the quality of education. So we have pupils who certainly will not have had access to the internet, access to IT, who would not have been encouraged or supported to be able to keep up with their lessons during the last summer. They've lost a whole year's worth of teaching and, and, and more so. But then when you, when you mirror that against where the big economic downturn is expected to become, then there's a, an absolute tsunami heading towards, you know, parts of the world. The north of England is one of them. So, you know, to generalise, we are going to have fewer jobs. We're going to have children who are relatively more left behind than their counterparts, um, certainly in the private schools, but also in, you know, London and the southeast. And this is going to be a legacy that's going to be here for, for decades. So I don't think we understand yet how big a challenge this is going to be. And I don't think we understand, apart from just money, I mean, everyone, including me, we're all talking about the levelling up agenda, but uh, a large investment from government now, I'm not sure we understand yet how to spend that in a way that's going to best try and bridge this gap. But it, it's a massive, massive worry for me. And I think the health aspect of coronavirus, however tragic, when we look back with a long lens of this, you know, 100, 200 years time type of lens, then I think we'll talk more about the economic downturn than we'll talk about the health um, impact. Uh, what, what can leaders do in the short term, Richard, to support whether it is their employees or, or whether it is students in a school or teachers in a school? What can leaders do in the short term? And maybe we don't know long term. I think you've been you, you, you've showed a lot of honesty in sharing that with us. But what can what can be done in the short term and the medium term to try and support people through the economy and through education, especially? I think we've got to be more joined up. So, again, I, I take an awful lot of um, interest in the fact that I'm one of the few people in my region who sits on both the health boards and the economic boards and the education boards. And it's a really privileged position, but you get to see that one person's challenge is, is another person's opportunity, but we're not talking to each other across sectors as much as we should. Case in point being that we know um, in the NHS and social care, absolutely, that we have a huge workforce problem. You know, we have um, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of vacancies across health and social care. And yet here we are in an economy that's just about to prepare itself for an economic downturn and we're losing thousands of jobs um, every every month, you know, with, with new announcements almost every week, it feels like. We need to be able to put those two agendas together. We need to be able to say that we can get ourselves at least partially out of this mess by starting to have a more seamless transition from out of work into the places where society needs the most, which at the moment is the health and care sector. But in order to do that, we need our... Um, our mayors, our metro combined authorities, our health leaders, um, our educational and skills and training leaders to be joined up. Now, actually, I would say that those conversations are happening. And one of the things that might become a, um, a long-term benefit 
out of all this is to have particularly I'd say health I'm, I'm you know sometimes slightly um, unfair to health but I think health by and large can be an, an internal sector um, an internal leadership community who don't see health role outside of delivery of healthcare services to its population which is you know albeit it's a job that takes an enormous amount of their time but I think as we move away from the immediate um, crisis of dealing with coronavirus, we might see health and health leaders looking outside more than they perhaps ever have at the world of economic growth, at the world of education, but particularly thinking, actually some of my challenge, for some of my challenges, there might be solutions that actually aren't in a room marked NHS. Um, you know, there's other money being spent. There's other money, other um, government initiatives to bring people back to work that actually could become a solution to some of the vacancy problems we've seen. So joining up, Lewis, is, is, is one of the things I would, I would absolutely say. On a micro level, though, and this is something that I'm very passionate about in my own organisation, just showing concern for staff. I mean, that is the number one thing. It, it, it was the number one thing to, for me, my personal philosophy. It was the number one thing to do as a leader before the pandemic. It's absolutely the number one thing to do as a leader now. And it will be the number one thing to do as we learn to live with and beyond COVID-19. And just a very short um, understanding of, for me about why that's the case. When I was um, in my formative years in the NHS on the graduate scheme, I was really lucky to spend three months with a professor, Beverly Alamo Metcalf. She was a professor at Leeds University. And Beverly's interest was transformational leadership. And in effect, she had developed a model of leadership that had 13 different characteristics. And each characteristic had a weighting to it. The idea being that you know an ideal transformational leader would meet all these 13 characteristics. But what was interesting to me, and I, I was able to hear Beverly speak tens of times, is that of all those 13 characteristics, there was one characteristic by itself that carried 60% of the whole. So in short, if you did one thing well as a leader, then this one thing would be 60% of you being a transformation leader. And obviously I've already given it away. That thing is to be, to show concern for staff and to show concern for staff in the smallest possible ways. To be able to ask somebody on a Monday how their weekend was and know that actually what they told you on a Friday, you know, come back to that conversation, show that you care, show that you listen, show that you're interested in them. Show that go beyond, above and beyond, you know, when people are sick, when people are off work, when people are not seemingly themselves, actually not say to yourself as a leader I don't have time for that I have too many direct reports to do that but start to say that's actually my job that's the reason I'm here and I need to find time to do the other stuff because this is the stuff that takes priority so that's how I that's how I um, run my leadership philosophy and certainly in this pandemic it has um, proved to be the right move so showing concern for staff and going above and beyond on their way on their welfare. Could could you give us a few um, real life examples or tips or pieces of advice of, of how leaders and people that work with other people can do those two things? So I really like that idea of being more joined up, of essentially saying, you know, go to the end of your street and don't stay on the same street. Take that extra step. Have a little look what's out there and, and find how you can connect. And then also looking at how we can show that concern for staff in a real genuine way that, that, that makes them feel valued. Can you give us some tips or, or, or little ideas of how that might look or what that might be like within a, an, an organization or an educational establishment or a team? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the, the first one is, you know, how do you get more joined up? I think you need to sit back and understand where else in your ecosystem or your kind of wider sphere of influence where else is your is your job being met by other people or by other bodies so to make that real when i talk about my education role and i talk about my economic growth role for me um fundamentally i, I see them as health jobs you know i, I it, there just happens to be another group over here and i'm not engaged with them yet you know until now and but they're spending hundreds of millions of pounds on things that absolutely have an impact on the social determinants of health. So there's a health job there. We just haven't defined it as such. Just because it doesn't have health on the title doesn't mean it's not a health job. Same with education, that's a health job. 
you know, the, the skills and training agenda is absolutely going to be the thing that lifts people into better health, better wealth. And we know that better health is better wealth and vice versa. So for me, that's how I've done it. I've started to understand where my job is also being done in other places and gone off with a level of curiosity, knocked on some doors and found that always in this life, particularly when you're volunteering for free, which I normally am doing, you know, that door is open wide for you. It's not, it's not slammed shut. So my advice would be to think laterally about where your job is also being delivered. And I think for different people in different sectors, that will probably have different answers. Um, but I can assure you that somebody else somewhere is doing a job that may look completely different to yours, but actually the outcomes are exactly the same. And then it's a question of knocking on their door and finding out how you can help. Yeah, I totally agree with with everything you're saying there. And I love that better health is is, is better wealth. Uh, it's certainly, uh, certainly the case in southeast of England, you can see. <laughs> um, tell us a bit more about diversity, Richard. In, in a team, why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, so this is one of my passions, Alan, and, and um, it's... It's something which um, this year of all years, you know, we've we've started to have more honest conversations, I think, about diversity and obviously Black Lives Matters and George Floyd, et cetera, but also the, the, the coronavirus pandemic itself. We've done, the business case is really clear. Um, diverse teams and diversity in all its shapes and sizes. Diverse teams are better teams. I mean, there is no argument about that. And yet we also know that sadly, um, you know, as human beings, we like to recruit in our own image and we have a level of unconscious bias that as leaders we have to, and we all have this level of unconscious bias, that as leaders we have to work hard to understand at the very least, but also try and mitigate as much as possible. So it's a hard thing to do, but if you get the business case about diversity, then it's eliminating groupthink and it's allowing... Um, it's allowing a team, a group, um, a board of leaders to better understand the people that it serves. Um, I think the, um, the research that certainly we've done would say, and this is not a health specific answer, but a team that happens to have one member of it that shares their ethnicity with the client, so client could be pupil, it could be patient, it could be member of the public. But that entire team is more than 150% more likely to understand that client because the fact that one of their team members shares their ethnicity with that client. So I think that for me is, is the, the summary of why diversity is so important. It's not just about having a specialist in your team, a specialist at your board, whose job it is to go and interact with people who look like them or share the same kind of protective characteristics of them. It's about the fact that the inclusion of that diverse person in the team lifts the entire team. It lifts the entire team's thinking. And just to bring it back to health, to give you an example of why that's so important, as we look at our health inequalities, and again, you know, we, we talked about the pandemic and how that's clearer now than ever before that our job is to look at minimizing and reducing health inequalities. I've started spending an awful lot of time championing and supporting our black and minority ethnic innovators in the NHS, because actually 19.8% of our staff in the NHS are black or minority ethnic. That's one fifth of our workforce. If we're not allowing that workforce to get their ideas across, to develop their own innovations, then we're simply saying goodbye to 20% of the future ideas that the NHS has at its disposal. But when you get, when you get into it and you start looking at these really, you know, these fantastic um, diverse innovators, you realize that by and large, no matter what they're working on, they've all brought their lived experience into their innovation. And therefore it's richer, it's more able to um, target yet to reach communities. It's more able to have something to say that's going to impact on, on health inequalities. So there's a richness to diversity. There's a richness to people's lived experience that we're simply not harnessing. 
And if we're not deliberately trying to create diversity in our teams, then we have to do so, I think, eyes wide open and know that we're making a deliberate choice not to have that kind of insight. It is going to make the entire team richer. Richard, would it, would it be too simplistic to say that uh, allowing, um, allowing ethnic minorities within a, a team situation to deal with clients and to deal with employees from a same ethnic minority, is, is that essentially just an opportunity for connection of understanding that's almost subconscious right from the start? Would that be too general? I think it depends on the circumstance, Lewis. So it's, it's definitely something which you need, um, you need to have services, you need to have um, public facing services of, of any kind where every citizen or every individual who is able to access that service feels comfortable. And so, you know, whether that's in our, our judiciary, whether that's um, in retail, you know, it doesn't matter what it, what it is. So there's something about representing the communities that you serve, which I think is paramount. Um, I think it's, um, I, I, I struggle to, to get to grips with um, this notion that you always need to pair diverse people off with each other because it almost mm. seems like you're, you're highlighting the difference, you're highlighting the otherness. Yeah. So obviously sometimes that's important, particularly I think for me, the, the idea that comes to mind most is language issues. If you have somebody who's a native speaker of a particular language, it makes sense to, um, to, 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 to make that, that link. But by and large, I'm wary of that kind of matchmaking exercise because it feels like you are drawing attention to the other. Um, for me, it's more about being able to say, by having diversity within a team, any member of that team should be better equipped, you know, better equipped factually, better equipped emotionally, you know, to be able to um, talk and deal and contact with people from different cultures and backgrounds. Yeah, cheers, Richard. I, I, was, I was thinking of it in terms when you were talking about the NHS, um, I'll, I'll go out on a limb for a second and talk about how just being in the Philippines for so many years, and I'm sure Alan will, will see this as well, you see a huge number of, of Filipino nurses being used in the NHS. So one of the, the things that struck me as you were talking about that would be the power of a strong Filipina female within the NHS in some kind of managerial position. Now, I'll, I'll be really honest here. Am I talking far too generally and in tick box terms there? It is actually the effect of that going to be much deeper than just having somebody from the same nationality. I think that's the kind of thing I'm getting at. Oh, I see. What you mean. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, no, that is really important. Right. So I, what I what I take from that is role models. Hmm. Role models are hugely important, and I think it's absolutely imperative that people see, um, let's say, people who they resonate with. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be people who look like them, people who sound like them, but people for whom they have an affinity because they recognise that there's a shared difference of some kind in positions that they aspire to. So that's that. Um, the role of role models is hugely, hugely important. And, and actually, as somebody who is now, you know, with a bit of horror being told that they're a role model, um, it, it, for, the, for the post holder, it brings an enormous amount of pressure, huge amount of pressure, because you feel it every single day. Um, it's because your ethnicity or your difference Whenever anybody has a difference that defines them, there's something which is likely to be the first um, term used to describe the individual, good or bad, then you feel the pressure of, of having a perfect game. You know, that's how it feels, you know, the baseball kind of metaphor. It feels like you're trying to shoot a perfect game because actually your margin of error is a lot less than somebody else's because you're not seemingly, and this is something the individual can't, give themselves, but it's something that's almost given to them. You are um, almost seemingly responsible for not just your own personal career development, but the, the potential careers of all those people who are looking to emulate you. And I think it's a very unfair pedestal, actually. I don't think, well, I don't, you know, we don't do it with our 
white male leaders. We don't say a white male leader has failed, let's not try a white male leader next time round. Um, but that's because we don't describe a white male leader as a white male leader, we describe them as a leader. But if we say a black male leader has failed, then actually there's an undertone there that we might try something different the next time around. So you feel that very acutely and that, that notion of, I have no choice but to, to hit the perfect game is is something that you just have to carry with you. And is that a pressure? Is that a pressure that affects you, or is that a pressure that really enthuses you and motivates you in your role? I think it it, it depends on it depends on my energy levels, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> I think um, it can be both. So it it, it, it can be hugely um, debilitating um, to think I've got to be better than, and also that sense of you are always permanently on, if you like. You know, you can't ever switch off and have a bad day because that's not how you do a perfect game. But having said that, there is without a doubt, and I'm delighted to say the majority, this is the majority of the time, a huge joy in the privilege of having that position. What's been really noticeable to me is that um, the Black Lives Matters movement in particular, um, but the, the whole real uncomfortable conversations that people have been having this year because of what we've seen happen has led me to personally feel like I've got a bigger shield perhaps than I previously felt. And it's all a very internalized kind of sense of this, but in essence, what that means Lewis is that I feel more able to challenge. I feel more able to shout louder. I feel more able to be provocative to write articles about this kind of stuff, to write articles about how it affects me in my daily life, you know, how it feels to be a, a black male leader in the NHS and to, to put it out there without embarrassment and without apology. Whereas I think previously there was certainly a sense of, I had to nuance this, I had to protect other people's feelings. I had to be wary of the, the backlash that might ensue. I think right now, and this may be a temporary period, but it feels like you can absolutely not have to put anybody's feelings um, out there apart from your own. And that, you know, as a leader, I can now say, do you know what, guys, this is how it feels. And if you don't like that, that, that realization, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, tough. Do you think we're getting to a stage, Richard, where that sort of reluctance of people to talk about it in case they got something wrong or in case they offended somebody, do you think that's starting to disappear and people can be much more open in those conversations? I think, yes, in the, in the better conversations, without a doubt. I mean, I also feel, sadly, that, that there is a, a growing backlash to this. And, and, and that's why I wonder if it's a temporary situation, a temporary nice situation to be in where we can just have honest conversations as humans. I, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, every life matters, all life matters, all that nonsense. You, you feel something growing there and swelling there. But yes, on the better conversations where people are genuinely curious and humble, then you can get past the, um, the tiptoeing that, mm -hmm. you know, feel so acute. You can always feel the person trying to have this conversation with you tiptoeing in the most uncomfortable way, not really knowing what's right or wrong. And I think we've been able to um, put that to one side, largely, I think, because people, uh, people who are genuinely trying to be allies now have learned that the right thing to do as an ally is to say, I now know that I know nothing about this topic. And I'm here to listen, I'm here to learn. I will make many mistakes along the way, but I'll do so with humility. And I will, my only intention of being here is to make myself a better person and to then help this support this, this, this agenda. And that's different from coming in and thinking, you know, the white savior model, where we may be seeing that too much in the past of, I am here to help these poor people who can't help themselves. Therefore, I need to know the answers. I must know the answers. And therefore I'm gonna potentially do more harm than good by, you know, not tiptoeing, but <laughs> taking massive leaps into um, uncomfortable, poor language choices, or claiming that I know the answers and I'm, I'm here to help you. So 
that level of humility, I think, that our white leaders are showing, that's the right place to start the conversation now. And I think that's a, a message to probably take into anything, isn't it? If you can go in there with a little bit of uh, humility and you can go in there with an attitude of I'm willing to learn and I might not get this right, be patient with me and, and let me learn along the way. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, um, I go right back to one of the very first bits of training I had as, uh, in the BBC when I was uh, doing a bit of journalism as well. And this, this sense that when you're a BBC researcher, you are given so many weird and wonderful topics to get involved in, and you always know nothing about it. And, you know, for me, you know, it was as, as whiplashing inducing as, you know, one day you're working on the Nottingham Carnival, the next day you're working on a programme about North Yorkshire vets. And that humility of constantly being shoved into situations that you know nothing about you have no choice but to just ask questions and to listen really hard. And I think that, I think, is what I'm starting to see now in, in other people. You know, it's, it, it, they, they're starting to recognise that the, despite what they might previously have thought or said, they know nothing about this agenda. And the only thing they can do is ask a good first question, listen really hard to the answer, and then continue to ask questions. And that's all you can do. It's a good piece of advice for anybody listening, isn't it? And we're, we're going to start to wind it down a bit now, Richard. And I want to ask you, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given as a leader yourself? And uh, uh, and in what context were you given it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been given so, so much. Um, but I think for me, the, the best piece of advice that I was ever given was um, to recognise the humanity of everybody. And what I mean by that is, um, certainly for, you know, um, a black kid from Maltby, um, from a mining background, when you're walking around corridors in Whitehall and Westminster, it's an incredibly daunting place. And these people, these leaders are larger than life. What I've learned now is that everybody's human. And that was a bit of advice that I was given is to stop seeing the office, stop seeing the position and start seeing the person behind it to know that no matter what mask people put on and we all put on these masks the same masks that i developed for myself when i was at Maltby, everyone's human behind it and if you can find your way to believing that then you can have a much more peer-led conversation you can find the humanity in it and and, and the confidence in yourself then to, to go forward so i've always tried to just see the person behind the role and that, in a sense, makes me more comfortable and makes me more able to justify my own reasons for being in the room myself. Great piece of advice. Um, next one for you, Richard. Um, what book are you reading at the minute? Is it any good? Uh, is it any good? I, I, I think that might depend on your political, your political outlook. So I'm just finishing rereading a book, actually. I, start, I read this summer when... <laughs> This summary was a piece of fiction, and 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 the same book is now a bit of a bit of um, a bit of nonfiction. It's a book called "Will He Go?" It's by a guy called Lawrence Douglas, and it's about um, the, the the subtitle is Trump and the looming election meltdown in 2020. So it's a very slim book, written by a constitutional academic. Where in the summer he hypothetically set out a number of different scenarios that may or may not happen should the president choose not to leave the White House and what, what levers were available to him in order to stay despite a closely contested and um, debatable presidential election. So as I said, that was an interesting piece of fiction four months ago when I read it. <laughs> and now it feels almost like a how-to guide. Um, so I've really, I've really enjoyed that actually. Oh, Alan, have you got one? Yeah, I mean, Richard, you've showed incredible honesty and humility as a leader. I'm, I'm interested now in your, what are your three non-negotiable behaviours that you have as a leader? Yeah. Um, well, the first one that springs to mind absolutely is um, respect for everybody. I think... Um, this goes back to the point I made about transformational leadership, but I, everybody in, a, in an organization, everybody in the room, every, everybody 
needs the same level of respect you know whether you're a ceo or a secretary or a janitor or the you know the driver the minister the minister's driver i don't like it when i see hierarchical levels of respect being deployed um i am always always more inclined to be um impressed by the person who gives as much attention to the secretary in the room as you know the minister in the room so so for me that that would be one bringing fun to the job i think that's also true i think you know we're we're in really privileged positions we all do jobs that we absolutely love i think it's absolutely i don't like environments where people somehow deny the existence of fun and humor despite the you know the political pressures or the the real you know sometimes health um, you know, um, issues that you are dealing with, you know, particularly in the NHS, it can be a very somber time, but you've got to be able to find, you've got to be able to find the fun in it. And then the third thing for me is, is, um, is work-life balance, um, you know, increasingly becoming more and more important. Um, that's not to say that, you know, I'm not a clock on at nine o'clock and clock off at five o'clock kind of guy by any means, but flexibility, perhaps that's the key. That's the key word for me in that. Um, I, I hate jobs, and I've been in jobs before, uh, many of them I've mentioned already today, where the culture was such that you had to be at a desk, you had to be seen to be at a desk. Whether you're productive or not was irrelevant, but your your capability was measured on your presence. I'm much more interested in jobs where you're given trust to succeed and be flexible about how and where you go about doing that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, fully agree with you on that one. And it's really hard. I mean, you're married to a teacher. You know how you're almost married to the job as a teacher. And it's very hard to strike that balance. And we often talk about there isn't one in teaching, except in those blocks where you're on holiday. And then you're still yeah. thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, and it, but if you're loving it, I think that's fine. And I, I, I'm, I'm certainly somebody who, you know, the, the idea of sitting by a pool with your Blackberry, of course, is not an idea that fills me with any kind of joy. But... I don't mind taking work with me on holiday. I don't, I don't mind doing things like that because I absolutely genuinely love it. Um, I think I, I, I'm more sorry for those people for whom they, they, they want to get away from work and they can't get away from work. Um, my thing is stopping myself from working. I, I think particularly with the working from home culture that's now emerged as, you know, from 2020, I'm lucky enough to have an office at home. You know, so this is where I am now. This is where I live basically. But it's never you know my commute is now 10 seconds and so stopping myself from being in here is is uh is probably one of my bigger challenges yeah and then leaving your thoughts behind as you usually filter those through on the journey home or the journey to work that that becomes yeah. more and more difficult doesn't it it really does Lewis. and actually that's one of the things that i'm trying to get better at um and, and i'm thinking i need to i need to have i need to insert a routine in between finishing work and being at home and Exercise probably is the thing I'd probably go to on that. Um, but I definitely, I definitely need to put something in between finishing and then being at home. On the subject of learning new things, our last one for you, Richard, what, what does infinite learning mean to you, we call ourselves, um, and, and the, the kind of approach that we have, the infinite learners, because we're very much committed to continuing that learning journey as we go through. What does that phrase mean to you? Well, I think, I mean, for me, it's a great phrase because... It's something which um, you know I've certainly tried to adopt for me. I think it's almost so obvious that it's hard to describe for me in the sense that although outwardly I project, I know I project because I've been told I project this many times, a sense of confidence, a sense of knowing what I'm doing, what I'm talking about. You know, this comes back to the resilience and the mask at Motby. I know my own head and probably I'm the only person who does. And I know that I am more that BBC researcher walking into new places every time, hearing new information about new things and not really knowing what it's all about and having to digest and understand. And so for me, life is continuously learning because I'm never in a situation really where I feel comfortable to know that I know my way around this particular scenario, this particular challenge to be met, whatever it may be. Um, it's always a new thing. Actually, I find that really energizing. I'd hate the kind of job where I knew how to do it. Um, I like the kind of job where every day I'm learning how to do the job better. 
I can guarantee you that the day I wake up and think I absolutely know this job inside out and how to do it and I can do it in my sleep, I'll be off. Because that kind of thing, it literally terrifies me, that kind of thought. Um, learning to do the job is what makes a job enjoyable. So that's what it means to me. I think we'll finish on that one, Richard. Thank you. I, I think you're exactly right. Many people try and get to that point where, where, where they're, they're crossing it and they're ticking the box and they're achieving. And, and actually, it's the journey and the, the learning along that way that makes it such an exciting prospect and an exciting exploration. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Richard. I, I'm, I'm sure Alan has too. Yeah, amazing. I, another hour of complete learning for me. And I've got so many takeaways from that. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank you both. I think what you're doing here is fantastic. I love the series. Um, it's great for you to put it on and to go the extra mile to, to give something back. So thank you for asking me. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it too. And I'll let you finish off. Top man. Thanks, Richard. Guys, search Infinite Leaders Live on YouTube and Instagram. You can find us on theinfinitelearners.com, on Twitter and all popular podcast platforms. Until next time, goodbye. And another massive thank you to Richard Stubbs and all his hard work and his time uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. Thank